Okay, well, hello everyone again. This is the Open Network Security Monitoring Group meeting at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, <coughs> the weekly network security monitoring user group. And this is the final meeting for the semester, and we will resume again in the fall. So let's go ahead and make it through our group updates. So uh, we actually had a few different sponsors uh, in the past uh, few months or so um, contributing to our GoFundMe uh, campaign. One of them is Doug Burks, uh, the guy that maintains and author does, uh, is the primary author of the security onion uh, Linux uh, distribution that is based on NSM. Also, we had a tier two sponsor that is Chris Sanders. He wrote the Applied Network Security Monitoring book and does a lot of uh, consulting and such. And thirdly, we have uh, Ryan Stillians of Vigilant Technology Solutions, who also contributed. And we'll get, I'll have, he has a few, his company has a few job openings, and we'll get to those in a, minute, a few minutes here. Uh, next, uh, we are still running the campaign, so if you are interested in contributing to the group, do check it out. Uh, we are doing uh, much better than we anticipated or expected. Uh, let's see here, we are up to a little over $2,500, so doing very well, and we'll be using this, uh, these uh, donations to contribute to our various projects in the future, which can include uh, research, our NSM laboratory, and um, conferences, swag, and so on and so forth. So uh, plans for the summer. Well, we I just mentioned the network laboratory, or the NSM laboratory plan on working, or having, hopefully having up and ready and racked and such, so everybody can use it for the next semester. Also, business cards and t-shirts, inspired by Sick Pony. And um, I'm actually, a few of us are actually going to be working on a NSM-based curriculum and video course. And that includes uh, me, Shane Rogers, and Mike Downey. So uh, we're not really sure how we're going to release it yet, but right now we are slowly uh, taking the effort to actually create a, a learning environment for students and various modules that they can learn all about open or uh, concepts of NSM and their practical application. And finally, uh, the website. So we plan on redoing the website. You can see that it's pretty um, old, like 1995 HTML-ish. So um, it'd be nice to revamp this, maybe with a content management system, or what seems uh, looks really nice right now are those static page generators, such as uh, like for GoLang, you have Hugo, and for Python, you have Jekyll. So we may look into those to do static generated content that makes it look nice and easy to, to manage. So something to look at over the summer. Move right into the meeting sections here. So networking news, uh, Sturcata 2.0.8 was released, and this is mainly a big bug fix release. Also, Argus 3.0.8 was also released, again, another bug fix, uh, bug fix release. And then you may have heard of the NSA's quantum insert attack, and this consulting group out of the Netherlands, uh, Fox-IT, came up with a really nice article on the attack which is essentially a man on the side attack, not necessarily in the middle, but it, it, it exploits a race condition between uh, the server's response and the attacker's point on the network. So in the NSA, they would have the ability to have various uh, insights of networks by tap points, for example. And if they, if a client can then send a request out to a website, for example, and they, they can uh, see the TCP sequence number of the TCP segment, that is the NSA or the attacker, they can then insert their own and hopefully it reaches before the actual legitimate response from the web server. And that could be used to do HTML redirection. You can do a 301 or 2 redirect and then have it so that the attacker or the victim's machine downloads a payload. So this is actually detailed in this. There's a little 49-second uh, video on it. They show you that, um, the visual representation of the attack. Do check this out. And they have various different attacks. So quantum, quantum insert is specifically uh, the man on the side one, but they have also ones for uh, IRC, uh, DNS, uh, Facebook users, etc. So do check out this link for more information. Uh, the next article we have up is a, I didn't actually get a chance to review this one, but it had some uh, following on the internet, and that is uh, detecting forged Kerberos uh, ticket use in Active Directory. So if you'd like to check more information about that, do see that article. Also, um, Bro 2.4, the beta, is actually out now, and there's actually some new analyzers that are really cool. Um, one is 
the MySQL analyzer. So we can actually take a look and pull out MySQL uh, events and, and queries over the, over the wire. Also, we have an RDP and then a new uh, version of the SSH analyzer. Uh, Justin Azoff, a member of the Bro team, rewrote Bro Cut in C from Awk as a huge performance boost. Also, he tried writing in Python and Golang, and it wasn't really much of a difference. But of course, C, where we can really see the optimizations. So uh, do check that out. Along with this is the um, broker, the broker library, Bro's new communication library that is replacing Broccoli. And finally, the uh, external plugin architecture that is now available in Bro 2.4. NextFNG has had quite a few uh, new patches lately um, from a guy named Vadim. And now we have, we have a new tag release out. So um, new build uh, system reworked for cross compilation. Uh, you got file rotation on a stick up signal and various improvements to uh, the dissectors, including NetLink messages. And I mentioned uh, earlier, the last release had support for uh, Linux kernel's um, packet fanout mechanism. So now you can actually have, uh, it's a new socket mechanism, or I shouldn't say new, but it's a socket mechanism in the kernel that allows you to do clustering. So you can have multiple processes, and the, the socket can then uh, apply various algorithms to distribute packets to those processes. So you don't need something like PFRing or uh, the BFD's NetMap, for example. You can do it natively in Linux. So you can then therefore uh, round robin, for example, all the packets across different NSF NG processes, or et cetera. So that is something to look forward to. Um, and then finally, uh, Security Onion needs testers. They have a bunch of new packages in queue, and they're looking for people to try it out in the VM or on production or development and just kind of report back on the mailing list what the results are to see if everything's working. So do check them out and help them, please. Uh, conference course. This is where we talk about uh, various conferences that come up, usually near us here uh, in Illinois. Um, uh, ThoughtCon will be in Chicago this weekend. I believe Shane is going. Yep. Uh, anybody else going in here? Uh, Tyler's going as well. Uh, B sites. Uh, Chicago will also be that weekend. And then uh, BroCon will be uh, in August, by the time that we resume, I think. And then the other one that's not InfoSec related that I need to plug because I love it so much is Hamvention. Uh, for the world's largest ham radio convention. And I'll be there this weekend. So there's a lot going on this weekend. Hopefully I'll find some servers and such to bring back for open NSM or lug to tinker with. DEF CON calls CTF too. Okay. The qualifying for the CTF or DEF CON is happening then too. All right. Good to know. And then uh, the next section we have Opportunity Outposts. So this is one of our sponsors. They are, they are looking for two positions to fill, a HUT team analyst and a senior HUT team analyst. And so what Vigilant Technologies does is they're a, they're a company that does managed NSM services for small businesses. So if you're interested in being part of their team, or uh, checking that, go ahead and check all those links, check it out and find more information. You will get to play with various uh, intrusion detection systems, themes, and other tools that would, that would be really enjoyable to play with. Also, um, let's move along to the next section here. Uh, we do have a lot of notes today, so I'm trying to fly through these guys. Um, tool trade. So Netflix introduced a new tool that they released as open source called Fido. Let me quickly open this link here. It's rather long. But it is their automated security incident response system. So basically it takes in a bunch of events you can see here from different uh, systems such as malware analysis, threat analytics, sensors, etc. And it puts it in their uh, correlation engine and it stores in databases and they have a dashboard. But it's a better way to analyze and kind of add some sort of metric such as severity to a particular event. That way you know or the analyst can kind of focus his energy on what's more important. So I think they gave an example, I think they this article here, such as um, the IP address of um, the CEO or C-level people. So if you have an event related to that, such as an IDS intrusion, an IDS level event that has the right address in it, you would flag that as maybe a high level incident that should be investigated in the main length. So just a way to prioritize things, it looks like. So do check that out, it is free and open source. Also, we may have heard of this, but Abuse.io came out, and this is a framework or a, a tool to manage abuse complaints for network operators. So if you're interested in that, do, do look at their website and see if it caters to your needs. 
And the last section of tool chain, we have our very own Shane Rogers. He was working on this project called Sniffy for class, which is a little home packet analyzer. So he's going to talk about that. Yeah, if we could just, uh, just click share screen. Yes. Let me, uh, I'll have to stop real quick. Now click it, you should be able to take over. Do it, I think. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is just, uh, as he said, it was a simple PCAP analyzer that I put together for a class that I was taking. Um, it's, it's on here. If anybody wants to take a look, just go to GitHub Buster Bytes slash Snippy 2.0. This is a, I talked about this tool a few months ago during the meeting. Um, I've since then added a little bit of functionality and wrapped a GUI around it in class. One of the nice things about, um, I would use Scapy to do it, and one of the nice things is how easy you can make it. And still I was able to impress the heck out of my class moderator once they started talking about um, packet analysis, source ports, and protocols. He, he, they sort of glazed over and he was very impressed. Um, let me pull it up here and I'll show you real quick how it works. Yeah, so while Shane's doing this, I want to mention if anybody's interested in doing any uh, workshops that, are, that deal with programming, um, such as writing libpcap applications or scapy based applications for packet crafting or sniffing, uh, do let us know. We are interested in that. It would be nice to have some programming classes or workshops. Okay, so this is, like I said, it's really simple. I just open up the, the file searcher here, find a PCAP that I want to look at, open that up, and then I've got just some basic protocols that I've written into here, and I can go ahead and take a look at all of the TCP packets that went through in that PCAP, and just click on that, and if it's not in there, then It'll tell me there's nothing in there. If there is, I think there's some FTP in here. Then I click on that. Nope. All right, let me look at the other PCAP. UDP would probably work on that. Oh, no, here, this is the one I want. I think there was some ICMP traffic or something in there. Uh, yeah, so this one should have no, be no, FTP, no FTP in here either. But there will be a bunch of TCP packets in here for sure. And most of this is handled by Scapy stuff. It just uh, gives me all the all the details, and you can even see that there's some uh, everything you want to know about all the packets in there. I've I've got it numbering them, and you can scan through anything. If there is if there is data in the um, in the packet capture, then it'll show that data there too. So, anyway, it's real simple, but it's just kind of a work, a little toy I've been playing with. Cool. Kind of fun. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I've been meaning to play with CP2 or several times yet. Seems pretty powerful. How do I give up the. Um, top, at the top, you should be able to, uh, it says more. I should stop, stop the screen. Sharing. Sure. I'll stop sharing. There it is. Okay. Thank so, you. All right. I'm getting back here. Okay. And then uh, for our last two, we have two more sections to cover real quick. So one is this. Um, this is not really um, a paper, but this. I don't know if you guys heard of ben, Brendan Gregg, but he is an expert in performance system performance, so if you're looking for optimizations of applications and systems, do check out his stuff. And he wrote a lot of the dtrace user land tool to take advantage of the dtrace uh, trace stuff in the kernel, and that's mostly for Solaris systems and uh, BSDs, but now it's actually being ported to Linux. And essentially, it allows you to profile the Linux kernel, so you can sample, you can check out every system call, and every, it's really nice. So I've been learning a little bit about that. But he came out with this book a few years ago, which I'm reading, and this kind of ties back into the research we plan on doing. Like one of the research projects that we wanted to get funding for was to actually do a performance comparison of various uh, packet sniffers. And um, 
hopefully be able to analyze them, see where they fall apart or where they can improve, and just kind of document all and write a paper about it because it sounds interesting and fun. So we're, this is one of the books I'm actually going through to help prepare myself for that. So if you're interested in anything from um, file system performance to cache line efficiency in the CPUs to uh, static and dynamic profiling of the kernel and the application, system call tracing, et cetera, I highly recommend checking out this book. It was released in 2013, but it's still it's still up to date, and he wrote it in a way that it plans to be using methodology as the key points to actually keep it uh, relevant for a long period of time. So I do recommend checking out that book. It's great. And the last portion of paper period is I actually got a paper. I was working on a paper a few months ago with two of my colleagues, uh, Adam Slagle at the NCSA and Jeanette Dopheide at the NCSA, and we actually just got accepted. Um, so I wrote some software a while back called the Isolated, Scalable, and Lightweight Environment for Training. Basically, it's a tool that allows you to take advantage of Docker uh, containers to, uh, to provide quick uh, training environments for users in conference settings. It's been used at the University of Illinois, at Flowcon, and some other places uh, for training, uh, such as uh, training, uh, the training in Bro. We use it at Brocon 14, but quickly I'm going to pull up the paper here. And the, the big thing here is like the, the architecture I want to quickly go over. But you can see we have um, the host system here, and you have Docker, which actually has your training images. So you actually build the, the Docker images with the program that you want. So we did an example with um, for the actual Linux user group I run, I run here on campus as well. Um, and we, we want to do a C training course from uh, one of our students, Devin, was really interested in C and wanted to teach people some C. So, you know, what we do, we fire Docker, create a new image, just install uh, GCC and a few uh, uh, libraries and such, and we were able to immediately put that in Islet and have it up and running within five minutes we had a training environment. So it's really easy to use. And we did some performance metrics, um, which is really what I wanted to show, because you can read the paper for more details. But um, comparison between uh, this, Containers versus virtual machines, you can see the cost of virtual machines per number of users is actually higher, per cost per hour, than if you were to use Islet, because you can uh, handle many more users if you look at the x-axis here at particular points where we have a break. We based that break on a particular program that we were running, and that was training with Pro. Also, another thing, a claim that's often heard in the industry is um, Docker container startup time. I've seen many websites, as CoreOS as a website, will say, hey, these containers start up in milliseconds. But I've never seen uh, it substantiated, so we actually did that here with a number of tests. And you can see uh, from our, the system that we, this one system right now, we did a number of systems. And um, here it was about 0.4 seconds on average, roughly, uh, for startup time, which is pretty nice. And then uh, we did it, a number of containers running concurrently. And you can see, we hear the system load, and we actually hit, hit a point where about 700, um, we actually uh, jumped up sharply. But the number of containers, so this, in this case, it's actually used, uh, we were actually trying to show the number of users where a user is tied to a particular container. So that way, you can see that we can actually hand most like a system that's running 16 core and Amazon EC2, that you run out fairly cheap, uh, fairly reasonably, you can run 100, 200, 300, 400, without saturating your system, your I.O. and your load, your system. So it's just a nice way to handle large events. So that, that's not just created containers, but that's actively... Yeah, this one's uh, a running a process in each container. So you're like 700. Yeah, and this one's just running a lightweight process like top. But typically users would just have a shell like Bash, which right. is, it's in, once it's running, it's fine in memory. It's completely do other stuff. But yeah, we were doing just fine with top. And we also did one more with Bro. And Bro, here's the real world test we did, a simulation. And this is with Bro. Um, so this is the number of simulated users. So every simulated user has their own container running Bro. We did a loop over like 10 minutes worth of loops between Bro and PCAT files over and over. And Bro takes a lot um, of, of juice, you could say. We did a memory profile of Valgrind here. And the hit of Valgrind from the heap was about 80, 80 megabytes for running through a small PCAT file. Um, so it, there's, there's quite a bit of, it's pretty intensive. Um, but yeah, so stuff in here. Someone can use that mic. You're a hack elder. Really? 
really? <laughs> That's all I gotta say. All right, well, anyways, we'll, we'll wrap that up. So yeah, so we did with Bro, and we, <coughs> what we hit here uh, for the processing cutoff, where we actually based it on the, the amount of time it would take for Bro to actually execute the repeat file, and I, we said six seconds was way too long for the user, which is triple the amount. It was two seconds on a, a barely on the host on bare metal, but with the containers, keep adding it ended up being six seconds for point we cut it off. We were able to do about 60 users for that machine, but Bro is a very intensive process, so why don't we stuff? You'd be able to do many more of your training. So check that out, and if you're interested in looking at highlights, let me give myself a little plug here. Um, let's go to GitHub.com slash John Ship slash Islet. You can take a look at it, you can download it and just you know take a look and see you know how to install it, what it can do for you, and give me feedback. All right. And then the last section we have is the signature signature selection. This is where we'll talk, this is where we talk about a new exciting in, uh, signature that comes out. And this one's for the NSA quantum insert deck. So the guys from Box IT that consulting group in the Netherlands that wrote that article we talked about or we touched upon earlier came out with some detections for um, the quantum insert for three different IDSs, and they did it for Bro, Snort, and Suricata. Snort, they actually had to make a patch so that they could keep, keep track of old TCP segments in the stream processor. So um, the problem was that Snort wouldn't be able to track it, so you couldn't tell if there was an injected uh, TCP segment from, the, say, the, the adversary or the attacker. And um, you couldn't compare that to the legitimate response and see what, what was different in the payload. So this, this new option they allow with this patch allows you to track old ones on the number that you, allow, that you want to track. And then um, Suricata didn't actually need any changes. So they had a stream event called reassembly over payload overlap different data. And then you can actually just use that and with these simple rules right here um, to actually detect that. And then finally, um, Bro, needed a patch as well, so they, they modified the, re, uh, the retransmit inconsistency uh, event to actually track the old segments. See, that seems to be a problem. A lot of these IDSs aren't tracking the old ones, so here you can set the value of how many you want to track. And then uh, once you apply that patch, then you can use it to generate the event. When the, arc, when the event's generated, then it's, you know, you print, hey, possible attack. Also, they did do a, you know, the old, they did do the, um, the detection without that which of course is gonna be a lot slower because of the way they did it. So here, just to quickly go through this, here they use the uh, quantum insert module, they define their own namespace, then they exported a new notice, which is what's gonna be used to actually send the notification, just say, hey, this is a new IDS event, essentially. They would call it payload differs, and then they export a few variables in the data structure called a record. And so here is how they actually keep track of the last sequence somewhere in the last payload, and then they use this TCP packet event. So every time a TCP packet uh, actually comes across the wire, this event will generate, and you could have tons of TCP packets, uh, especially on just the anode where you come across, because that's what you know, most protocols are using, especially with the users uh, facing stuff. So this is actually going to cause a large overhead in Bro. So that's one of the reasons why they made that patch to the other, to the actual uh, event. But you can see here, we actually just test that there's an established connection. So if it's not established, then we return, we exile the event. When we also exit out if it's from the client. We're only concerned about the server response because remember it's a race condition between the server or the attacker. And then if the, if the payload is actually a length of zero, then we also don't want to, we want to return out because it doesn't matter. We're actually looking for something, some data in malicious payload. And then we store a bunch of the sequence numbers and the payloads and a bunch of variables. So all we do is compare it. So we compare the last length versus the current length. Um, greater than or equal or less than, and then based on if there's a difference, then that could suggest, and the payload is different, then that suggests that someone injected something into the stream. And then of course, once that happens, we generate a notice called quantum insert payload differs, and that's what you see in your notice.log, or if you have email or accept, to actually send you an email with that, with the information in it. Okay, well we did cover a lot, but now we're going to introduce Adam here. So tonight's guest, we do have a special guest from Malwarebytes, um, Adam. He is a, he's been doing a malware analysis for a long time. He runs the uh, malware intelligence, or excuse me, the malware intelligence team at Malwarebytes with over 10 years of experience in, a, in analyzing threats of APT state-sponsored nature, et cetera. And uh, he'll be talking about patching malware and malware code analysis. So um, everybody, without further ado, we'd like to give it up to Adam and thank him for coming out. 
So, um, Adam, I'm going to stop my screen sharing, and then you can go ahead and click share. All right. Thanks a lot. Here. Hi, everybody. Hey. Howdy. Hey. Thanks for hey. talking to us. No problem. No problem. Thanks for listening. Uh, <laughs> everybody hear me okay? Yep. 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 All right, cool. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. <clears throat> Just tell me when it comes up. Well, I want to, yeah, it's up now. I want to ask you real quick. Do you prefer, uh, do, you, do you allow questions during or do you prefer questions at the end? Um, if you have if you have a question that's like not going to take half an hour to answer, then then ask me now. Otherwise, uh, if you wait till the end, I do have a, a section for questions. You know, okay, great. That's uh, but I, I'm I'm happy to answer questions you know in time or if somebody has something they want to add to it, uh, maybe their own experience or anything like that. I find that's always a little more helpful to to help everybody understand. <clears throat> <clears throat> so did uh, does my screen show up yet? Yep, it's up. All right, cool. So uh, this this little talk is called uh, Malware Mind Control or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Patch. <laughs> um, basically, uh, it's it's uh, the rundown of, of patching binaries, but specific, more specifically malware um, when it comes to reverse engineering and doing any sort of in-depth code analysis. Now, uh, from what I understood before, there hasn't been a lot of uh, code analysis done. Um, so is, is, are there a lot of people that are familiar with it, uh, familiar doing it, or messing around with it that are that are listening right now? I've done a little bit with I. I took the GRAM course a while back. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Play with some samples, but other than okay. that, I mean, there's, there's a there's a whole front section that it just kind of goes into the very base uh, the basics of of code analysis. A really a uh, quick crash course. I don't know how fast I can go through that because <laughs> honestly, that's the boring part. And, uh, and not the fun part. <clears throat> so um, let's do let's start out with our intro. Um, what is uh, how does how does reverse engineering apply to malware analysis? So um, as my slide says, the identification or classification of malware may require a deeper level of analysis that you can't get through dynamic or static means. So you can't uh, you can't get it from just staring at the file or, or you know running things like uh, checking on its properties, checking its its strings, things like that. And uh, and you can't seem to make it do what you want to do to give up the information you want um, by just running it dynamically. And that could be for a number of reasons. I mean, it could be because of your hardware setup, because of your analysis environment, because of anti-analysis or anti uh, or, or VM aware. Um, functionality within the malware itself, so you never really know. Or maybe it just doesn't want to communicate. So malware code analysis can reveal undocumented functionality, provide some clues as to attribution, sometimes, not all the time. You know, if, you, if you're the kind of guy that, uh, or the kind of person that, <clears throat> that sees a lot of different kinds of malware from, from Russia to China and the US and everything else, um, you might pick up some idea of, of how the different countries and how the different uh, writers from different countries create their malware. However, uh, a lot of, when it comes to state-sponsored stuff, it usually ends up being that, that the people that are writing that malware know about these little tells, and they'll make their malware seem like it's coming from somewhere else. So, like I said, sometimes, not that often, you know, it, it's good to, to throw out there, but uh, I wouldn't, I would depend too much on it. I mean, as any of us know, when it comes to working with malware, you know, cybersecurity in general, attribution is, is the biggest pain in the ass we have to deal with. So uh, it also allows for a deeper understanding of how the malware works, which is always fun and great. So uh, x86 assembly is basically the, the language that, that you will read all the time. You will live in it. You'll, you'll sleep in it. Um, it will become your friend and your and your enemy, uh, and it's the lowest level of human readable code unless you're the kind of person that can read like hex opcodes and then fantastic for you. But for everyone else, you know, having something that you can actually read, a compare, a jump, you know, memory address, things like that, this is as, as high as you can go. When you're dealing with malware, uh, all malware is compiled for the most part, right? Um, all malware that is that is you know an exe. Anyway, um, and built in C or C++ or something like that. 
So it, it's all compiled down to machine code. That's, that's so that the system can, can understand it and can read it and can execute it. As such, when you try to go backwards, you don't get the source code because the malware is not written in a scripting language. So you can't just open it up like JavaScript or something and just read the source code. Um, what, you, what you get, the highest you get, is uh, assembly. So learning assembly is, is pretty much paramount for this uh, kind of work. You don't have to learn it to begin with. You can just jump in there and then eventually, hopefully you'll pick it up. But honestly, I always recommend learning assembly, at least a little bit of assembly uh, before you, you start doing any serious reverse engineering. And then uh, registers are small chunks of memory used for holding on temporary values. So there are gonna be a lot more terms that I could use, but I'm not going to because really what we're going, what we're going to talk about here is, is the methodology behind patching, you know, why we patch, how you can do it quickly and easily. Don't worry. If you, if you want to be, you know, a uh, reverse engineer, if you want to do the deep code analysis stuff, you will learn all about stuff that has nothing to do with malware specifically. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it here. So uh, flags are a very important part uh, of this process. Um, there's multiple flags within a processor. Uh, the one that's the most important that we're gonna talk about right now is the zero flag. And uh, if there is a compare um, or, or some sort of operation that's done that returns a value uh, to, to say yes or no, uh, either yes, it, it, it's equal to or no, it's not, um, it may set the zero flag. And when the zero flag is set, that's when you have uh, different kinds of opcodes in assembly that will read the zero flag and say, is this set? No? Okay, well then I'm not gonna do whatever I'm supposed to do. Uh, registers, as I mentioned, um, there's a whole bunch of them. The most commonly used ones are, are EAX and ECX and EDX and EBX, but the, a lot of them other ones are, are very important. Um, Stack pointers, uh, base pointers, and then of course the instruction pointer, also very useful. However, things you don't, when you're using a, a disassembler or a debugger, when you're using a debugger and you see these registers, they're not really that important at the time because you have a visual representation of where you are. Um, just some examples of assembly. So push and pop, uh, messing around with the stack, uh, jump. There's multiple kinds of jumps, and jumps are probably one of the most important parts of assembly. It's how you get around uh, to function to function. So uh, basic arithmetic and then call and returns, which if you're familiar with any programming, you understand you call any function to make it happen, like um, you know, write file or, or, or whatever, and then return from the function. So <clears throat> the two main tools of reverse engineer are a debugger and a disassembler. Um, Ollie Debug is my favorite, although some people like WinDebug. And depending on the malware you're going to be dealing with, you may want to uh, learn WinDebug um, because it's, it's much more valuable and much more applicable when dealing with rootkits. Uh, when dealing with just user level malware, Ollie Debug is fantastic. And uh, IDA Pro is my favorite disassembler, and there aren't a lot out there. Um, all these tools are free. I made sure. Uh, there are there is a free version of IDA Pro, and all versions of IDA Pro that I will mention and show uh, during this talk will be the free version. So there are fancier versions if you got the money um, to spend lots of money. They even have uh, tools that can that can turn assembly into some sort of uh, pseudo uh, higher level human readable code that might make it easier for you. <clears throat> So uh, a debugger allows the analyst to sequ sequentially execute or step through the opcodes of a program, um, which means that it's like uh, if you're watching a film and you, you take out, you know, you, you tear it apart and you look at frame by frame, and that's basically what happens with, with the, uh, or a debugger, is that you look at the program frame by frame and you execute it one uh, instruction at a time, <clears throat> if you want, or you can just skip to the, you know, the end or wherever you want to go. A disassembler creates a visual representation of the malware um, or the, the binary period. It tears it apart and you basically see everything you see in the, or the debugger. However, it organizes it and it shows it to you in a way that can make a lot more sense. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. This is all a debug. I know it's really small. There's no reason for you to need to read any of it right now. I'm just kind of showing you um, what it looks like. And uh, this is my particular uh, brand of it that I like the black background 
Um, the default is white, and you'll see it, and it's really ugly, but whatever. <laughs> and then this is Ida Pro. So you can see right there in the center, you've got kind of a graph. Uh, that is just the, the representation of the, the malware, the, the binaries themselves, um, and all the opcodes, things being pushed, things being, you know, whatever is being executed. Uh, it also shows you imports, imports and exports, which uh, imports are all functions that it reaches out to the, the binary will reach out and call. So from whatever library it might do it from and the exports are all entry points into the file. <clears throat> It'll show strings and there's, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with a debugger. It's just, or a disassembler. It's, it's a fantastic tool. It takes a long time to really learn how to do everything. You can write plugins, same thing with uh, disassemblers. There's just all kinds of cool stuff. So like I said, if you, if you really want to get into reverse engineering of malware, then there's lots and lots of stuff to learn, but it's it's totally worth it. So why would we patch malware? Um, and what is patching malware or patching anything? Uh, so the action of changing executable code as you execute the malware, that's patching. We want to change the code as we are running it or as we're about to run it. Um, and we do this so that we can observe new functionality uh, that's outside of what I consider to be the natural flow of the binary. Um, for testing and functionality, testing functionality and features that maybe you can't see uh, and overcoming anti-analysis techniques. So for the first thing, when I talk about flow, I mean when you execute the malware and you're following along with it and however it wants to go naturally. Uh, if it decides to run a certain kind of function rather than another, if it decides to jump in a certain place rather than not, if it decides to call a certain uh, API it, rather than, than a different one. You know, it, the, these things are flows. Um, and you'll see what I mean. I have some, some diagrams that kind of show this a little better. <laughs> and here's one of them. So here's, here's the flow. This is just an example, obviously, very, very high-level pseudocode. Don't, don't quote me on this being anything accurate. <laughs> but, uh, but the program starts out, and then it just starts moving in a certain direction. So at this point, you go from start, and it, it, the code will take a left. It'll go down this particular path, this tree of, uh, of, of different functions and different operations until it gets to this point at the end here, uh, memalloc. And what memalloc will do is basically allocate a certain chunk of memory where it can store uh, data temporarily, um, either for, for numerous reasons. And you'll see that a lot. Uh, WS232 is actually a very common the used um, library for networking operations. And uh, so when I say send down there, it means to send network traffic. Uh, load library is also a very common API you see. It, it loads the libraries for you. So uh, at this point, like in this example, the flow would lead the, 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 an analyst to uh, a return, to a, a terminate, to an end process, like the process, because for whatever reason, the memory will not allocate, right? Well, you can't just say at that point, all right, I'm done analyzing this later. Uh, you're going to go back, and you're going to say, all right, we're going to patch this now. So we follow the code to its natural you know, point all the way over to memalloc again. And once we get there, we see whatever value or whatever reason it's deciding I don't want to complete this transaction and we fix it. We change the code and make it go to send. And hopefully uh, in this instance it'll show us what it intended to send. So regardless of whether it actually sends anything or not, you want to find out what it's going to send, right? <clears throat> that's, that's the key here. So it, from a malware point of view, you might want to know uh, the network traffic before it goes out because it's encrypted. Maybe maybe it gets uh, obfuscated somehow. Um, maybe they use some sort of you know, high level of encryption when it goes out. But but if you're reverse engineering the malware, you can see the actual message before it gets encrypted, and then you know what you're going to be looking at. Um, the same goes for any sort of incoming traffic. If you do happen to be working on a on a sample that's that's relatively new and still active, that uh, the command and control. Um, servers are still communicating with and if they're sending back encrypted traffic you want to know what that traffic says <clears throat> so alternatively you can you can follow this route and you could also uh, decide hey I want to see where the other direction goes and you can do that you just change the input and there you go it leads down a different path entirely <clears throat> so what's what's the first step of, of patching 
and I say it's consulting your map. Give me a second. Is everybody good so far? Does anyone have any questions before we go further? So far, so good. No? All right, cool. <laughs> All right. So uh, there are two methods of reverse engineering, in, in uh, most people believe, and that is uh, <laughs> not show. Uh, that's reading a map and uh, walking the path. So. Think of it uh, between the debugger and disassembler. The debugger is your path walking mechanism, right? You step through the code, you step through the path. Um, the disassembler creates a visual representation of where you are, so it's a map. And uh, a lot of people decide that, that, or think that using one or the other is the best. I've met analysts that only like to use debuggers and they swear by it. I've seen analysts that only use disassemblers and they swear by it. They don't want to run the code. They can just figure it out by looking at it. Other guys say, I don't want to look at it. I just want to run it and see what happens. I think using both is the best approach. Um, because what you're able to do is uh, follow, follow where you're going, figure out where you're going to be going, um, what you're going to be doing, what, what functionality is going to be executed and stuff like that with your disassembler, with your map. Uh, and then you can start doing it in your debugger. You can start following that path in your debugger. And if you encounter something that is anomalous or some sort of dynamically created value, uh, you can input that into your map on your disassembler. Because disassemblers, especially IDA, allow you to do a lot of customization to the, to the uh, visual representation. So you can highlight things, you can put notes, things like that. And it'll help you keep track of where you've been so that if you have to go back, you know a better route to, of where you're going. Uh, so this is kind of what I like to do. Um, basically, like I said, I, I would I would follow along in the debugger. I'd go through some code. And as I as I run through that code, I'd go to my committee assembler and I would highlight the particular function that I was currently in. And this tells me I've been here. This is the natural flow of the program. This is where I'm supposed to go. So you can see this very, very poor pseudocode <laughs> that I wrote up. And uh, basically it's just saying, this is the input that's being, uh, this is the part of the program that's receiving input, that's deciding what to do with it. And um, it's comparing it to the write command. You know, let's say that a, that a C2 is, is beaconing out or, or sends out a command to a bot uh, malware or something. And it says, you know, blah, 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 write. And so the bot will take that in, it'll decrypt the, the malware, decrypt the traffic, and, and pull out that particular command, right? Or, I mean, it'll probably be something far more, or far less obvious. Uh, and But it would know what to do with that either way. So you're looking at, at a switch statement right here, basically. <coughs> um, same thing, it compares again with, with the send input, uh, the send command to see if that matches the input. And uh, if it doesn't, then, then it'll go to the exit. If no input matches at all, then it just exits. <clears throat> In this case, um, you know, we're looking at write actually being, or send being the, the actual command being sent. And, uh, and like I said, you just follow it all the way down. You can track where you've been. And this, this shows you, all right, this is the natural flow. This is, this is what has been happening. This is what's going to happen. I can, can I can depend on uh, this particular functionality being executed and working correctly in my environment. Uh, the rest of this is just um, code that if you went to the other route. So, <clears throat> what if we wanted to see what is what is written? So we we saw a send. We followed it down. We were able to follow it in the debugger and find out what exactly is being sent. Cool. We got that. Now we want to find out what would be written if there was some values. Uh, if, if it's been it, if the malware has been told to write something to write a file or to write a document you write text or data or whatever it wants to do So we just modify the input itself We go to the, the buffer location where it's checking the input and we change whatever it's supposed to be there So let's say it's supposed to be send we put in write instead and now when we run through the code this particular uh, 401228 uh, instruction now uh, returns as true. It's going to jump now because the the 
the comparison between right and the input uh, is, is accurate. That's what it wanted to see. So it jumps down and it starts working on a whole new uh, feature, new functionality. So we change the input, we follow the code all the way down to the mem allocate, um, and we can observe the buffer. We can see whatever it's, it's trying to write into that memory. <clears throat> Alternatively, we can actually follow the code uh, further so what it does write to something and then see what it wrote to. Uh, maybe it'll drop a file. You know, a lot of times malware will create a file, uh, populate it with some data, use that in some way, either, either transferring it uh, between itself and another piece of malware that it created, or maybe it's duplicating itself somehow, um, maybe it's moving itself around, who knows, but uh, it'll, it'll create it and then delete it before, and if you're doing it from a dynamic standpoint, you know, hopefully your, your sandbox or whatever automated tools you're using, your monitors will catch what was going on, but this way, uh, you can take your time. You can say, all right, it wrote it. It's there. I'm looking at it. And as soon as it, it closes the handle so it no longer accesses the file or has access to the file, you can take that file, copy it, paste it, analyze it later. <clears throat> all right, so one thing I like to say, um, another kind of approach that I have toward uh, reverse engineering and malware analysis is to read between the lines. Now, what this means is that uh, when I first started doing malware now for reverse engineering, I just started from one. You know, I started at Go, and I just took steps. And I went down uh, looking at every single assembly instruction and every single call to every single function, and I thought everything was so important. And I got lost in the code, and it's so easy to get lost in the code. I like to make the joke from uh, from the Matrix that, you know, after long enough, all you see is, is you know, blonde, brunette, redhead. Uh, instead of instead of just all the madness of the code, um, but what I realized after that is that you know what a better approach would be. Why don't I just find out what I want to know first? So look at the imports. Is there a uh, is the import is your import list saying that you're going to have a shell execute, which is a, a, a function that will execute a, a binary? Does it have a uh, send or receive or anything like that so you know that there'll be network operations um anything like that strings look at the strings see if there's anything that uh hopefully the malware is not so packed that it's just uh, hiding all the strings but if you find some strings and you say hey maybe i can look for these within the code and see where they're being used and figure out the functionality associated with them and the same with exports you know if you have a a brand new export or or one that's not being used at all. Why isn't that being used? How do you get it to be used? Things like that. So rather than starting from the beginning, start from the end, or at least as close to the end as you can get, right? <clears throat> at that point, you work your way backwards through your map, through your disassembler uh, map. And you say, all right, here's shell execute. How does shell execute come back? For What caused that to happen? What feature am I in? What's calling this function uh, to make this happen, you work your way back as far as you can, so you get back to start, and you, you mark your way as you go. You know breadcrumbs and, and showing where you've been, and then <clears throat> when you are executing it in the debugger, you can follow that path. So you, you should always know where you're going before you execute anything. Otherwise, you can miss something if you just go in there with just you know execute, execute, execute line after line. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's important. Uh, it's it's messy and it can get frustrating and honestly, you know, it's easy to get stuck into a loop where you're like, man, this doesn't look important at all. And then you realize you've missed uh, a very, very important feature. One story I have for that is actually looking at um, the setup for for SSH. Uh, I've seen malware that will that will use, you know, secured uh, communications and everything like that. And it'll create um, It'll create a certificate and everything else, and it'll do the whole handshake and everything else you know, at deep levels. And for like three hours, I was staring at all this code that was in legitimate space. It was in legitimate user space, and it was, I was just like, what is going on here? I don't know what this thing is doing, and I couldn't figure it out until the end when I was like, oh, crap. It's setting up this secure connection, you know? Um, and the things that tipped me off to that eventually when I got there were the imports, were the strings, or things like that, and I just I couldn't figure out what it was doing, and then I realized what it was doing. So uh, it's it's really easy to get lost in the code. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it for. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It's always possible to get lost.
across. So, like I said, map, path, use them. Um, here is a is an example of of a, a really like what you might see. <laughs> So don't think of this as anything you have to follow because the point is that it's convoluted, it's messy, there's so much stuff going on. And in most malware, this is what you deal with. You know, it's not, it's not ever easy as, as a you know, sequential um, functionality that, that is supposed to happen neatly. Uh, it, it never does that. You're opening files, you're closing files. If, if anybody's ever um, messed around with, uh, with Procmon, and I'm sure you guys have, right? Uh, if you ever just collected everything that a, that a particular process uh, has been dumping, you know, has been doing, and then you go back and you try to look for just the one line that says, uh, you know, it says what you want to see, you know, like what, what files are being written or anything like that, or what registry entry is being modified. Um, and, but it's like hidden, hidden deep within just a pile of, of just, you know, access requests and opening and closing handles. It's ridiculous. Um, so you can think of the same thing that's happening within a binary. You know, these uh, the compilers will add a lot of stuff. If you have a, a, the source code of the malware uh, from the top level, yeah, the, the malware author might put a little convoluted things in there, you know, probably. But uh, in general, it's far more easy to read at their end. Um, and then they compile it. The compiler adds all kinds of crap. And when you try to pull back out, then you say, all right, I'm looking at what the compiler sends to the computer. You're not looking at what the bad guy wrote down. Um, so the whole reading backwards part, the whole starting from the from the the end and coming backwards is especially useful here. Uh, in this case, we want to try to get to the execute uh, function, right? Um, that's just going to execute some malware. I want to know what malware is being executed. All right, how do I get back to the start? How do I get to a place that I know exists, right? So a, a, an area of the, the binary that I know is safe that I know I can get to, and then I just work my way backwards. get there so does that make sense you guys totally cool yeah. <laughs> it's just so quiet I, I'm hoping <laughs> what, uh, what are you using to make these pictures good question PowerPoint yeah I mean, that's not I just graph you I'm just wondering PowerPoint PowerPoint oh okay. yeah. wow you manually made that yourself respect yeah that's <laughs> yeah. yeah um all right, cool. I'm glad everyone gets this. Uh, all right, we're going to move on. This is a, these are two examples or one example of, of a binary. Um, for those who are familiar with the UPX uh, packing method, UPX always pushes all of its, uh, all of its registers onto the stack. And then before it decides to start decrypting everything, and then when it's done, it pops everything off, right? So on the left side, you can see um, your debugger, and your the first one of the first instructions is push add, which is push all the registers, right? Now I know that at some point between now and infinity, there will be a pop add, and when pop add happens, I want to be there because that's where the legitimate code is. Um, I always say that that you know unpackers are great, you know if they work, but these days it don't often work. <laughs> but at the end of the day, all malware has to unpack. I mean, every program has to unpack before it can execute. The, the computer can't read packed code. So with that in mind, especially with reverse engineering, you can always get an unpacked binary. You just have to figure out where it spits out the legitimate code and decides to execute it. Uh, so in this case, I would use, and I did use, uh, the disassembler. I looked around. In an, uh, an environment in a way that was far easier to see than uh, than I would in in the debugger, and I found that pop up, uh, and then in the disassembler it calls it pop up, and then pop add, and then uh, the debugger it, it doesn't matter; it's the same thing. So I would jump to that instruction in the debugger, set a breakpoint, and then execute and get there. Uh, stop on the breakpoint, and then I would have skipped the entire decryption process and got to the juicy stuff. So, patching basics, finally. <laughs> <laughs> how am I? Uh, how am I doing on time, guys? You're good. Take good. all you need. Yeah, we don't have anything going on after. All right. 
I hope you like all these gifts. I, I honestly spend more time looking for gifts for these things than I do actually writing the content. Gift of Han Solo hitting the Millennium Falcon at me. All right, so step one, find out where you are. Uh, like I said, I found in uh, in Ida, in my disassembler, I figured out where I needed to go for that pusha uh, command, or papa command. And then in my debugger, I went back and, and, and actually navigated to that particular memory address. In all, you go to a memory address with control G, type in the address. In Ida, it's just G, type in the address, enter. So important. There are obviously is some sort of harder way to do it, but I've been doing the shortcut so long, I don't remember how to do it harder. <laughs> That's the easiest way. Uh, find out where you're going. So use Ida view, which is the, the whole graphed out view. Um, you can actually look at the code similar in a similar fashion as uh, Ollie shows it in Ida, but why, you know? Um, if you if you can look at the the visual uh, view and uh, the, the graph view, in my opinion, uh, that's what I think it should be called anyway. They call it Ida view. Um, but if you're the person that likes looking at the code line after line of code, you know, still you can use it in Ida. You can still make your highlights. You can still make your comments and your notes and things like that. You can still kind of uh, assemble things in a certain way to make them un more understandable to you uh, in that view. So. It's up to you. And also, if a particular function isn't complete, then Ida will not create a, uh, a graph view for it, which really sucks. So if there's like a start but no end, um, you know, when you're, you don't really deal that a lot with, uh, with, with cleanly unpacked, totally beautiful malware, uh, you deal with a lot of broken files or if it's crazy encrypted or if you've, unpacked it to a certain point and then dumped the memory and then uh, tried and failed at building the import address table and it just it's a, it makes a whole mess. <laughs> Step three, identify what you want to change. So using Ida still, you identify in the code what you want to do. You know, all right, this thing's trying to send me over to exit process. I don't want to exit the process yet. I have stuff I need to look at. So how do you change that? You know, you, you figured out I want to go to the part that, that executes the malware, it executes a new piece of malware, or writes a new, uh, some traffic that's going to send to the, the C2. Um, I don't want to exit. So then, you know, where's, where's the fork in the road? What values do you change? Where do you do that? Uh, so you, you have to figure that out. And once you figure out that point, you know, that, that crossroads where you can successfully get out of the, I'm on the way out, uh, path that the malware is trying to put you on, um, then you can go into your debugger and decide, all right, what do I have to change in here? Do I have to change a particular value? Do I have to change an entire uh, piece of uh, a chunk of memory? You know, what do I have to do here? Do I have to change the code itself? Uh, that's going to be fun to talk about. <laughs> and then you change it. You modify the code and execute away. So, uh, in order to, this is just kind of a quick cheat sheet on using Ollie to modify values. Um, I will read it out, but if anyone wants to take like a screenshot or something, make it easy for you, I don't know, uh, or just like take a picture. But basically in, uh, in Ollie for, for the registry, if you want to enter, uh, modify any of the registry entries, you can double click on it and change the value that way. For any of the flags, if you double click on it, it'll change it from a one or a zero. So it's a completely binary thing. There isn't any typing involved. Um, for actual opcode commands, uh, if you want to change the actual code, right click on it, binary, edit, and then you'll get a, a screen, kind of like what I show on the, on the right there. Um, actually, no, yeah, you might get that. Uh, or you could just double click it and it'll show up kind of a text view. The problem with the text view is that if you screw up or try to write it manually. Honestly, <laughs> it won't. It won't know what you're talking about. And uh, and I'll talk a little later about the problems and dangers associated with that kind of stuff. Um, and what's up? I was just gonna say, if, if you're willing to share these slides with us, we might be able to post a link to them on the YouTube video or on our.
our website or something like that. Yeah, of course. Or on the Facebook, the Facebook event itself or something like that. So that way we might not have to worry about taking photos of the slides and things. Yeah, sure thing. Not a problem. I'll send them over to you after this. Uh, Thank you. No problem. So, uh, so yeah, like I was saying, uh, modifying the buffer so much easier. It's just a big old chunk of memory space. If anyone's ever messed around in a hex editor, similar, you know, um, you can also do this with the stack. I didn't go in talking about the stack at all because I really wasn't sure, like I said, where your guys' level was as far as familiarity with this kind of stuff. Um, and I figured that the stack was probably something that really didn't need to be talked about. <laughs> Uh, but as far as modifying the memory and modifying uh, the, the, the process memory, you can do that all in Ollie, and it's fantastic. So what do we patch? Like, what, what are we actually going to patch? What are we going to change? And there are four primary patch operations that has probably never been written down until now, <laughs> honestly. Uh, there's the value change, which is super easy. Like I said, um, it's basically uh, your flags, these things like that. Super, super easy. Uh, registry changes, also pretty, pretty easy to do. Um, the only problem there is it takes a little more uh, awareness and responsibility in making sure you put in the right value, whether that's something you're going to be pushing onto the stack to answer, uh, to modify the output of a function uh, of an API, or if it's uh, an address that's going to be used that you're going to modify so that you can you know, have the, the malware load something or save something in a place that you want it to rather than it, it wants to. Um, memory change, a little more difficult. Uh, opcode change, you will mess this up. If I guarantee you that 90%, uh, you know, I'm going to be fair, about 60, 70% of time, you will mess this up. Okay, you will screw it up <laughs> because it's, it's so right. delicate. Um, and like I said, I'll talk more about it. Uh, in a little bit here, but it's it's hard, and I don't recommend doing it if you can avoid it. Honestly, there's so many other easier ways to go around. For uh, jumps, you need to identify the flag and modify the flag itself. The zero flag. There are multiple types of jump instructions, and uh, if you're interested, you should go learn more about these. Um, but I'm just going to kind of go the quick little thing over it. Uh, the zero flag in this case, jump if not zero, J and Z. If you see that in assembly, that means jump if not zero. And that's just checking the zero flag, like I said earlier. Uh, if the flag is set to zero, it doesn't jump, right? If it uh, is set to one, then it jumps. So if it's not zero, then it jumps. It's really basic, really simple. Just the whole uh, logic uh, gate and everything. So a uh, memory change for compares, uh, read and write ops, and, and mod and stuff like that, you want to modify the buffer value. So if you're having, like I said, input before that said write or execute or send, um, and you want to change what that input is, that's when you go in and modify the memory uh, in the buffer. So this is for variable patching. Um, in this particular instance, you, 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 I hope you guys can see this. I try to make it big. <laughs> Uh, a jump not zero command is highlighted right there, right? This wants to to jump uh, right now, and I, I don't want it to jump anymore. Or I don't. I think it's stupid to jump. Maybe it jumps to an exit process. So what I do is I go and I double click the Z uh, that's in the registry or registers in area in Ollie uh, in Ollie debug. You'll you'll be able to see it clear when you start looking at the the program itself, but. Um, in this case, there's the flag. I changed the flag. Really easy. Double click it. Whoop. And if you can't really say <laughs> it was pretty quick. But if you look at that red line on the on the screenshot on the left, it changes to oh, there it goes. It's gone. Now it's not going to jump anymore. Simple, simple, easy. Memory patching. Like I said, this is about medium. So. If you look in, uh, look here on the left on the screenshot, and you see this particular entry, gen code. Now that's a that's a built-in uh, value into this piece of malware. Um, that's that's hard coded. I don't know what it's going to use it for. It could use it for anything. It could write it uh, into a file. It could use it uh, as a, as a pop-up or something. Um, it could use it as as uh, traffic. You know. Either way, I open it up. I edit the data. So. At the bottom there, um, you see the actual hex code, and you can modify it that way. 
I like to just go up to where it says ASCII, double click that, and just type in like a normal human. Um, Cause I don't think in hex. <laughs> and so I modified it. <laughs> and you see that. Uh, now it's inside the data. Now, a fun little trick that I like to, to do sometimes, you know, I like to see the results of my efforts. So uh, if, if you, guys, you guys are familiar with Process Explorer, correct? Yeah. yeah. And you know, in Process Explorer, you can look into the properties of any particular process and look at the strings, and you look at the memory strings. And if you do that, while this thing is currently running inside of the scope of it being run by Ollie, then there you go. You get a nice bite me in the memory. <laughs> so just a little fun thing, just to make sure that, that what you're doing, you know, makes a difference. It might not be anything to you, you know, or to anyone else but you, but that's all that matters, honestly. This is this kind of work is the kind of work where you bang your head against the, the keyboard a billion times until one day it all clicks and makes sense and you feel like like immortal, you know? So little <laughs> little victories. <laughs> All right, uh, registry changes. So uh, when you want to modify the registry, you just double click the registry and modify the value. Um, opcode changes, they must be the same size as previous opcodes. This is something, like I said, I'll go into more detail about, but for now I'm telling you, if you try to put uh, a particular opcode in or change the opcode to something that, that something else, it has to be take up the exact same room as the previous opcode. Otherwise, you're going to get some overriding code. The next few lines may get overwritten by NOPS, uh, which are basically just empty areas of, of memory or, or space because um, this new instruction takes up, you know, so much that it, now that it needs to, to take from other places. Which it's bad. Um, you can either edit the binary or just type it out. Like I said, uh, you can go into the, the same kind of screen where I put the byte me and everything like that and you could fill it in that way if you want to, or put in the actual hex opcodes themselves, or you could type it in, you know, English or, or plain text anyway. Um, but like I said, unless you are copying it for somewhere else or you're just a master at this, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way because it's so easy to mess up and the debugger might have a certain kind of syntax that it wants to do that you may not be aware of. Um, so just be careful with that, you know. Uh, this is useful for redirecting code or adding new functionality, which I've done plenty of times, and honestly, it's a lot of fun to do, um, permanently modifying how the program runs. So if you have a program that is going to always check for a certain type of uh, whatever, anti-analysis thing or anti-VM thing, if you say, this is the only thing holding me back from running full-blown dynamic analysis and saving myself about 10 hours, um, then, then modify the code. You know, go in there, say, you don't exist anymore, or just completely uh, jump over that check. And in that instance, you just jump the binary, and then you can run it normally. And it'll run normally, except it will jump over uh, where it was supposed to do that check. So that's always fun. Registry patching. Uh, in this instance, uh, there's a, a call to read file, and... When, for those of you that aren't too familiar with reading uh, assembly from the debugger, uh, everything's kind of backwards. So where the everything you start at the top and you move your way down, right? Um, so when you see things being pushed, they're being pushed on the stack in a certain way, uh, <laughs> and uh, and they need to be pushed so that that when when you make the call, that all the parameters for that particular function are in the correct order. Uh, so they go in backwards and they come out normal, right? The, the typical uh, Q style. Um, or that other thing, I don't know. <laughs> so in this case, the buffer is being pushed onto the stack, and it's a buffer that's being loaded. The address for this particular buffer is being loaded by a register, which is EDX in this, in this instance. Um, I go into EDX and I modify it and I say, I don't want it to be here. You know, for whatever reason, I decide that this, this is a bad place to put a buffer or maybe I want it to go somewhere. I, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, there's, there's so many different dynamic instances that you could want to do something. So in this instance, I'm just showing you how to do it. Um, and you can see there, I, I put it not too far away from where I wanted to put it 
uh, but just a chunk of, of memory that I know is empty that's not going to be used in the immediate future and, uh, and move on from there. So I change it, and I did here, and you can see uh, here, it's actually the 1, 2, 3, 4 at the bottom there, um, that's 1, 2, F, D, 1, 0, which is the memory address that uh, I pushed onto the stack that I told read file to do, and it decided we're going to put whatever we read into that area. So just neat little thing, neat little thing to move around, good when you're dealing with uh, variables uh, that, that uh, when the malware decides to use registers to actually call something and push something onto the stack. Opcode patching, now the fun part. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so in this case, we have a, a jump. It's going to jump somewhere. Um, I decide I don't want it to jump where it's going. I want it to jump somewhere else. Maybe I'm tired of, of analyzing this stupid thing, and I want it to exit prematurely so I can tell someone that I'm going home for the day. I don't know. And so I modify the code, all right? <laughs> I change the address where it's going to a chunk of code that is previously, there's nothing there. There's just an empty chunk of memory. And what I decide to write there is a exit process. Uh, called the exit process. So previously that was that was not there and you can see this because Ollie will often uh, Change around color schemes and everything like that when you actually input your own code uh, It's not gray or anything like that. It's all red because I put it there myself. So that's That's an instance, but see if I tried to do jump not zero like I showed you earlier um, instead of jump the jump not zero op code requires more space than the jump does and I don't, can you guys see my mouse? Ah, probably yeah, not. But yeah, you can. Okay, this. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking here, um, right underneath the jump, about the next three operations are wiped out if I try to make that a jump not zero. And there's a lot of there's a lot of problems associated with that. And I'm about to go into that actually. Um, so let's let's move on. This will make a lot of sense when I'm when I get through this. <laughs> Any questions so far? I like the, uh, the, you appreciate the bite me. I'm glad I've, I've done something for you, you know? <laughs> All right, cool. Oh, go on. All right, cool. Oh, I was saying, no, no questions. My bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> that you said, I got a question. I'm like, oh, cool. What's the question? All right. So the top, <laughs> we thought the gifts, there weren't any. <laughs> I'm just hearing things. I just love feedback. I'm just making it up myself. Good job, Adam. Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <man. laughs> thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so the top five dangers associated with patching. Number five, taking a wrong turn. You are looking at your map, and then you decide, well, I'm going to go and not jump where I could have jumped before. And it turns out to be a horrible mistake. Um, Feeding the malware false input. You try to feed the malware something you thought it would like, uh, a command you thought it, that it matched you know, what it was supposed to get, but maybe you misspelled it, maybe you mis mistyped it, something happened, you got pissed off. Uh, writing over legitimate code, like I told you guys. Uh, you mismatch the sizes, and you're, you're in a world of hell. You know, you're in a world of pain. You don't, it's not good, it's bad. And that's because all of the things that I just mentioned will crash the malware, uh, possibly might crash the malware. The fifth one, maybe not. The others, yeah, you're going to crash the malware that way. Um, because malware isn't written like legitimate software, okay? Uh, legitimate software is supposed to check its input, right? Well, <laughs> I don't think that there would be a security industry if that was the case. Uh, but malware definitely doesn't check its input because it doesn't care. It's malware. Um, it's written by guys who probably have guns to their heads or something. So... Uh, so it won't check the input and it will crash. And finally, the, the, the number one danger is destroying the sample itself. Like you, you're analyzing it, you mess it up so much, you screw around with it so much that it, now it's just unusable completely. Um, and since we're all malware analysts in here, then we all should know that the best safeguards are to take a whole lot of snapshots <laughs> and use a virtual environment. Um, when you reverse engineering, it, it, VM will wear stuff doesn't matter anymore. 
Okay, you can get malware when you're trying to run it dynamically uh, that says you're in VMware, you're in VirtualBox, uh, you're running analysis tools. I'm not going to do crap. You know, you're screwed. You're 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 shit out of luck. And then you have to go run a bare bones box, and that's just a pain in the butt. Um, with reverse engineering, it doesn't matter because you're you're going in there and it says, oh, I'm going to check for VMware. And you say, no, you're not. Jump or or <laughs> change the value to say, no, there's no VMware. You know, use Jedi mind trick. This is not the virtual machine you're looking for, you know. Um, so you want to take you want to take a lot of snapshots every time you're about to modify a value, modify memory, and especially especially modify an opcode. Even I, while I was making this, while I was taking those screenshots um, for the opcode portion, I screwed up once. That's why I had the example for the jump not zero because I tried it and then it screwed it up. And I'm glad that I took a snapshot beforehand because I was able to go back and um, using a virtual machine. Now, uh, this is, is actually a very mild version of what my snapshot managers usually look like. Uh, this is very small. I multiply this by about 20, and that's well, usually what I deal with, OK? So a snapshot, 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 snapshot. You make it to a good point, you take a snapshot. You, you reach a part that you didn't think you'd get to before, you take a snapshot. You know. Um, Naming conventions, eh, you know, it, it, I obviously don't care for them. Um, I just write whatever is on my mind at the moment. And, uh, but some people, you know, like to put down, well, I'm, this is where I'm at. And that's good for you, you know. That's, that's why I'm not a programmer, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you ever saw any of my actual code when I did write uh, programs, then you'd see that, that my naming conventions for variables were just as bad. Uh, some words to the wise. Clear out your snapshots every so often and take up a lot of space. If I could show you, I can show you, actually. I'm on my computer right now. I'll show you in a second. But uh, my drive devoted to, um, to VMs is almost completely full. And practice, practice, practice. You know, the, as with anything, practice makes perfect. Uh, you do this stuff more and more often, it becomes easier. Um, like I said, when you first start doing the, the code analysis, it gets confusing. You get lost. You end up looking through, uh, you know, some Windows API for, for four hours and not sure what's going on entirely. And then you realize, oh, I'm not supposed to do this. or This is a wrong memory space. Um, <laughs> you guys are talking, like, what's up with the notches, man? <laughs> now I want some notches, too. I'm crazy full. Not your time. <laughs> anyway, um, practice, practice, practice. Keep it up. Uh, play around with things. Uh, like I said, the tools that I that I showed you, Ida Pro, uh, it's version five. I think they're on version like eight in the actual release, uh, which is really cool. But version five does the trick. You know, does the job. And um, an all ED bug. You know, play around. There's there's the touch for you. Uh, forums. I'm sure you guys are familiar with those. They, they got some really great stuff. The Lena reverse engineering tutorial is also great. Um, I, I highly recommend those. So you learn a lot. Experience is probably one of the most important things to doing this kind of stuff. Uh, you can you can learn in a book all you want, but until you actually see it in the wild, you know, and mess around with real malware, uh, then you're not going to really know what you're, what you're going to deal with. And now for some examples. Uh, I actually will show you guys a uh, an example. You can still see my screen and everything. Yep. Okay. Oh, real quick, let me let me pull up. Here we go. Okay. Uh, X here analysis. That's where all my VMs are, and that's where all the snapshots are. And before, about three or four days ago, that was in the red. <laughs> okay. You guys still see everything? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Not necessarily read everything. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you really to increase the size of the font. All right. Let me do what I can here. Let's see. I'm just. I. I was gonna show you. I right, still can. Can you read that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can read that. Great. Right. All right. This is this is some actual malware. Um, that we're looking at right here. And this one in particular is just a real pain in the ass for looking at stuff when it comes to analysis systems. 
so at first it's just looking for, for things. You Joe Sandbox, Control, Joe Beck. So it's looking for a sandbox. Wireshark, you know, we all use that. Sysanalyzer, some people use that. Um, you got a, a get tick count, which may or may not be used uh, in the, the course of, of identifying uh, whether or not um, a file's been analyzed or being analyzed. Sometimes malware will do that. We'll take a snapshot of time and be like, how long has it been since I did this again? Oh, not five milliseconds? Well, then obviously something's wrong. Uh, but if we go right here to this particular function, now this is Ida Pro, by the way, I'm sure everybody knows. I'm just going to zoom back. You don't have to read any of it. I'm just going to show you. This entire function, this is all one function, um, is made to detect uh, an analysis system. Okay, but we're just going to really focus right now on the part that's looking for VMware. Because I'm in VMware, and right here, uh, I don't know how many of you guys have seen or heard of. It's not really a, a problem anymore with more updated versions uh, of VMware, but it used to be a problem with the magic number. Um, and you can see it right here. It's just it's it's moving some hard coded value into AX here into a register and we want to figure out what it is. Um, Ida Pro is awesome. It could, it could just show us VMXH. Now that's the VMware magic number. Uh, in here, in this particular function, Answer it's question going, real quick. What's up? You, uh, you right click, uh, you know, you can change the character or decimal or whatever. What was that that changed that to the VMX? Is that interpret as string or what is that? Uh, yeah, I think it's string, or it just it just switches it over to ASCII. I think that's got to be a function of like one of the more expensive versions because I don't have that in mind. This and I've is got the crack six six. No, this this is <laughs> item. <laughs> Fuck them for charging for it. <laughs> there, freeware version huh. five. <laughs> I have no idea. Maybe I never saw that before. All right, it's sorry. not always there. No, it's not always there, though. It's it's not always there. It's, it's one of the problems is that VM, uh, Ida Pro is very uh, finicky about what it wants to do. It's not like it's a broken program, but you have to fit certain parameters. And um, in this case, we're lucky because, I mean, I can see something like this nine times out of ten, and it won't give me the option to, to make it something that I can read. Money. Yeah, right. <laughs> So yeah, this is checking for those magic numbers, and then basically what that happens is that uh, uh, the, the malware will will queue or, or query the processor for a certain value. It'll get it from the uh, you know deep down in system settings, things like that, and it comes out with a magic number. If it's the VM, uh, if it's VMware, it will come up with this VM exit or VM or VX, one of these uh, two options, and then it will compare. Mm -hmm. uh, the malware will compare that value to the, to the hard coded values. And if it determines, oh yeah, this is totally what I'm seeing, uh, then it'll return uh, back a value that, let's see right here, AL, AL, uh, that's uh, EAX. And we'll, I'll show you in a second inside of the debugger what that looks like. But um, it's testing to say, is, is this, if it's zero, then it'll return a certain value. If it's one, it'll return a different value. So it's not going to return a zero. It's going to return a one. Um, and that one is going to lead us to an exit process. Okay. So we know what the problem is. You know, we, we see, all right, this is going to, this is going to kick my butt. What do I do about it? Oh, I know this is going to be even harder to see. And I'm so sorry. I'm, hold on. Let me see if I can make it even bigger. Giant. All right. Let's try 18. Okay. <laughs> can you guys see? <laughs> That'll work. All right. So let's see. Uh, where are we? Ripe. I believe. Let's air test right here. All right, this is this is the I put a note here, a label. Check for VMware. Or don't, whatever. Okay, well anyway. Breakpoint. 
take me there. Or don't. Oh, crap. This is why I need to, to record things <laughs> instead, of, instead of just running them. Did you forget to sacrifice the demo gods this morning? I might, I might have. I might have already been to this point, and then I was like, oh, let's do it again. One second. Get back to where I'm supposed to be. Another problem that you may or may not encounter, uh, and I hope you don't because it's awful, is look over here on the left. You see these addresses, the CF183000. You know, that doesn't match up with what you see in IDA. Um, you can change IDA's base, but it's a real big pain in the ass. Um, and when they match up, it's fantastic, you know, but when they don't, you have to be creative. So let's go back to start here. 25, yeah, all right. Sorry, guys. There you go. 185. So there we go. You. All right, this crap here. Anyway, I don't know what's going on. Why it's not working for me right now? I do apologize for that. One second. Just lost like fifteen points of credibility. <laughs> No. All right, let's try to get back there. Eight, five, nine. What the, the hell am I? All right, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Uh, but basically, I'll show you what I would have done. Okay, <laughs> and you could have, you could, you could imagine um, where I'm going from there you okay so basically uh, here's the test right the test is going to return a certain value uh, I can tell you right now that the value coming out of this function right here the VM uh, checking function is going to give you an EAX of zero one like just one that's going to be the return value out of that particular function this is going to test say whether that's one or not what you do is say it's zero now and when the test comes back and it says, oh, no, it's zero, it's equal, everything's fine. And then it'll jump uh, to the next check and the next check and the next check. And I can show you a little bit if you wanted to see uh, what some of these types of malware do. Back up. Some of these. All right, well, this is looking for certain file um, probably associated with either a, a, uh, a sandbox or um, an antivirus or something. Same thing with this, sample.exe. Uh, this one messes around with SCSI ports. Yep. So, I mean, that's the kind of that's the kind of malware you're going to be dealing with um, sometimes, and that's when this stuff comes most in handy. Honestly, uh, dealing with other malware, reverse engineering, and being able to patch and stuff like that—it's it, nifty. It helps, but it really is the most useful when you're dealing with malware that won't execute, it won't run inside your analysis environment, or is doing something that you know, that, you know, what else it could be doing is is far more dangerous. Um, you know, my my experience, uh, I used to tear things apart and completely. And I'd spend weeks tearing apart malware that uh, and figure out every single command it could take and everything else. And that's when this stuff came the most in handy. Um, you know, these days you have new variants popping up every other day uh, or every day even, <laughs> you know, hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of samples, of different variants of the same malware family. And so it's kind of unrealistic to... Uh, to sit there and, and take apart every single one. But when when the time comes that you come across something like this, you're really going to be happy that, uh, that you have uh, the analysis skills and you know how to do it and you can get it done quickly and efficiently. So uh, are there any questions? Any, 
Yeah, um, I'm curious as to like what it's like to be on a uh, malware analysis team. Like, like where do you, like how often do you guys actually get, do the samples? Where do you get your samples from? And like, what do you do with the information you get from them? Okay. Just kind of like wondering what, where it's like everyday life, kind of in the as an analyst. Okay. Well, um, you've got two. I mean, honestly, these days there really is a two route system for that. There's the route that I took, and there's the route that other people take. Um, my personal one, and I will talk about the others because I know what they do. Uh, but my personal one is is a route of being a, a voice. You know, I I'm the kind of best basement dweller that can actually speak to people, and uh, so I do that. You know, I'm here. I'm talking to you guys, and I go and I talk to the media, and I go to conferences. <laughs> And I talk to things like that, and and I, I I work malware intelligence, and so I I stay you know three steps away from from uh, sitting in the uh, what do they call them the foxholes you know and and <laughs> things like that, but uh, and that's what I choose to do, you know, um, but that's not for everybody, and a lot of the people on our on our dedicated research department don't, and what they do is that every day they get up. You have dedicated malware hunters. Um, obviously, there's sources that they go to, you know, certain uh, lists and uh, sites and things like that. Obviously, we have a lot of connections with Virus Total, um, pulling down, you know, valid malware or ones, anything we don't detect, things like that. Um, but we also employ our own honeypots uh, to collect new malware from exploits in the wilds, and we get those those URLs for those exploits also from lists and other sources that we have. Um, we have dedicated, like I said, dedicated hunters. These guys will go around into the, you know, the cyber underground and, uh, and be able to pull out new samples or, or new things. Um, so we get it from all over the place really. And once they come in, um, it's usually divvied up, you know, uh, certain samples that are, that seem to be more difficult, um, are given to certain analysts that have you know higher skill, and the easier ones uh, might be given to ones that are that are not quite as, as highly skilled. Uh, and through whatever method that's that's required, uh, I can't obviously go into a lot of detail about how we do things, but <laughs> at Malwarebytes um, specifically, but for the most part, the whole industry is is moved toward much uh, an automated approach. Um, some places are trying to do automated uh, signature creation or or threat profiles or whatever you want to call them. There's, uh, if you listen to anybody who's in the business part of this industry, you know, obviously the whole world's against uh, definitions. You know, they're against signatures. They're like, why are we going after malware after the fact? And the fact is we're not. You know, this is the most effective. It always has been. Uh, how often do you hear, if, you know, heuristic uh, analysis is, is the, the future and the way to go, then why isn't everybody using it? You know, <laughs> why isn't everybody in that route? Why is there still malware? Why is it still a problem? And that's because we're not dealing with a computer. You know, we're dealing with, with people. We're dealing with, with bad guys who change as often as we do. We've seen malware that targets the exact uh, methods in which we used to detect them. And they change just slightly enough, just a very, very small amount. It might be just one value being changed. And, and that's it. And then we say, oh, you son of a bitch. Well, take this, you know, <laughs> we go back and do the same thing to them. And it's a cat and mouse kind of thing for now. But like I said, most, uh, most companies, most organizations are going toward a more automated approach, whether that be the, the approach of getting computers to write your definitions for you. Or um, what I prefer is just using it as, as a tool to where you've got sandboxes, you've got, you know, databases, you've got um, computer learning and things like that being used to help you, uh, identify weak points better or being able to identify uh, groupings and relationships. Uh, that's, that's something that's really, really going to be the future in my opinion. Um, but back to just the daily life, they go through their samples, you know, they, they do what they do. They run it through uh, FP checkers, obviously, because that's the last thing you want is a, is a false positive going out there. Um, and as far as Malwarebytes goes, we push updates about 10 times a day. So, I mean, I, we got a team that's just busting their ass all the time. And uh, when they finish their, their chunk, I mean, some of them say, all right, I'm, I'm done. And other ones uh, say, I don't sleep anyway, so what does it matter? I'll keep working. Uh, and that's, that's basically the day in the life of a malware analyst. Um, like I said, for, for me, it's more of a, more of a, a I kind of 
live in between the research space and kind of a marketing press side, uh, which is very confusing and loud. Um, and I miss the days when I used to just do nothing but stare at a screen and you know, hide in my cave. But somebody's got to be out there telling people about this stuff, you know? So <clears throat> does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. And then we had a question in the chat from Cody, if you, if you see that. Yeah. How often in practice do you mess a patch up and then the malware ends up running because causing you to snap back to the last snapshot? Oh, um, all the time, every single time. That's why snapshots are so important because you will literally need them almost every time. <laughs> uh, every time I analyze malware, even if I'm just doing dynamic analysis, uh, I will take a snapshot before. And I mean, part of it is because you will get infected. You're going to infect yourself. Yeah. But also, you know, setting up the tools, it takes forever. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, don't, don't think of yourself uh, any less because, you know, malware escapes your grasp and you end up infecting yourself. It happens all the time. That's why we all work in, in you know, um, isolated environments as we have uh, dirty networks and closed off systems. And so we don't connect ourselves to the internet. Um, we work in VMs and things like that because we're dealing with, with radioactive material. You know, it's, it's, we're dealing with explosives and that's what a lot of people like to use the term instead of executing the malware in a, an analysis environment, they like to say detonate the malware. And I'm like, whoa, detonate, come on. You know, this isn't a grenade, but some people think it is, you know, and, and honestly you can't kind of compare it. <clears throat> we have the enterprise edition. He's telling the truth. <laughs> Which part of the truth? <laughs> the good truth and the bad truth. We have like maybe four or five updates a day. It's yeah. like almost updated every uh, 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah. It's like version 4.8.9. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. So a lot of work. Yeah. Well, you know, we at Malwarebuy specifically, um, we, we stick to the brand new stuff. If we haven't seen um, a certain definition hit, for like, I don't remember exactly the time frame, probably a year, then we take it out of our database and we, we say, we're not protecting this anymore because it's not out there anymore, you know? Like I said, we have, we have exploit honeypots, we have methods of collecting brand new malware, the malware that, that, that our consumers and our customers are facing right now, um, which is always the juiciest stuff, obviously. <clears throat> but we always tell people to use an, an AV as well because we're anti-malware, they're antivirus. They can deal with the old stuff. They can have their, you know, heavy database and everything else. But at the end of the day, if you look at the testing, if you look at uh, just, you know, what people say, I mean, we, we, we kick butt. But we're not the end-all, be-all, you know, solution. And and honestly, that's a big trend that's – it's if you guys don't already, you know, talk about this or have talked about it with your friends and family, the layered approach is necessary. You know, you can't – the malware is one aspect of this. And honestly, it's not even a hard aspect of it. The malware has not changed in the last decade just a whole lot. Okay. You, I predicted, and I'm sure a lot of other people predicted, the emergence of crypto locker. You know, it was going to happen because that's just kind of the lifestyle, you know, the, the, the life cycle. What else would have happened? You know, you see um, Revitin uh, type ransomware, the FBI ransomware that, that we saw maybe a year or two ago. I'm sure most of you guys remember that. And, uh, and everyone was like, oh, no, you know, and, and they fell for it. And uh, I don't know, I got calls from about three different people that I was related to about the same thing about Reviton. And I'm sure you guys dealt with that, too. Um, but if you actually go back to, to the early days, the first days of, of malware back in the early 90s and stuff like that, and you look at, at some early ransomware that actually, you know, there was ransomware developed, and some of it did some encryption. And it was very light encryption. It was really easy to get around. And the encryption avenue was something that a lot of the more modern uh, ransomware creators uh, decided not to deal with. They're just going to block it or lock down the system in, in some way, and then people will just get upset about that. Um, but you could tell that, all right, this is effective method. It's worked really well. Uh, people aren't going to fall for the whole FBI thing anymore. But So you're going to need to say, all right, we need the same kind of attack, but from a different approach. And then, all right, well, what's next? Encrypting files, obviously. And, full-blown, real, um, you know, real ransom kind of stuff. So, and, it, and it, like I said, it's the malware itself, not, 
not what it used to be. You know, it, it hasn't changed a whole lot. The attack methods also haven't changed a whole lot in the sense of how they're technologically done, but how they're done in in reference to how they attack the user. See, that's that's a whole different game that we've been dealing with for the last few years. Like I said, the ransomware stuff, the FBI ransomware, I saw a ransomware that not only accused the user, excuse me, of, uh, of like looking at child pornography, but actually put an image of child pornography on their system for them to look at and said, this is that image. And that was just the most despicable and disgusting thing I had ever seen in this industry um, myself, you know, and I've seen a lot of like other gross stuff, but, but that took the cake, you know, because it, it was a psychological attack through and through the actual technology behind it, the coding of the, of the malware, not that intricate, not that hard to get rid of, but to someone who doesn't understand this world, you know, to someone who, who's even just a novice or, or, you know, someone who doesn't grow up with it or we stayed away from it. You know, suddenly you have the FBI apparently telling you that there's something wrong with the computer. But even if you heard about this, uh, this FBI ransomware and say, Oh, well, this probably isn't real. Now you've got this, like totally disgusting, totally illegal, totally uh, something that you think people would judge you for if they thought that that was actually on your system thing on your, on like showing on your screen and saying, pay us hundred dollars or you can face the embarrassment of going to your tech support or going to your friend and saying, Hey, I got this infected. Apparently it thinks I have child porn. And then, you know, the, 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 the psychological damage that does to a person is, is ridiculous, you know? Um, and so that's that's the future. You know, the layered approach is not just keep buying more products, but education, giving people the tools they need to to understand the threat landscape and to deal with it. You know. Let's see. Uh, um, if anybody has any questions that are remote, you can uh, unmute your microphone and ask them, and then mute again, or you can paste it in the chat. Uh, I've got a question. What's up? Y'all hiring? <laughs> uh, for what? What, what do you want to do? <laughs> I've used these before. Well, I, um, uh, you, you have work? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a whole, if you go on our website, narrowbytes.org, we have a career site. And uh, right now we have a couple of openings. Um, I'm not sure how much longer they're going to stay open, so I would move on it quickly. But um, we definitely look for uh, I mean, experience is always great, but just education and uh, ability to learn quickly and, and a passion for the job is is probably key. So I know that the research guys, they've, they've been down the road of hiring people that don't know how to do the job and try and train them. And it was just hell for them. And they're like, swear off it now. Like, so, but, uh, but yeah, apply. Apply and see what happens. If anything, I mean, we have support positions or – point you in a different direction you know there's, there's this industry is going to keep getting bigger and bigger which is good and bad you know i always say we're all in the the the, the habit or that we're in the, the the industry of trying to put ourselves out of a job because all of us want to protect the users and get rid of all you know the dangers of the internet but if we did we wouldn't need us anymore you know so <laughs> yeah that's probably not likely <laughs> exactly it's ever going to happen, and it makes you sad, you know. It's, it's sad. And, and yes. I have a question. Yeah. This is sort of off topic, but uh, we are in, coming up on the second year of our Illini CTF or UIUC CTF competition. Uh, that'll be well, towards the end of the year. I'll be looking for people interested in creating challenges for us. Mm -hmm. It seems like you know your way around uh, reverse engineering and. We're wondering if I could bug you later on this year for possibly writing a challenge for me. Yeah, sure thing. Oh, I can't promise anything, but I definitely see what I can do. Awesome. Yeah. I'll point you in the direction of somebody who I know can do a good job. Right. Yeah, that that, that would work as well. You can give us a an unpaid intern, or you know, your basement dweller of choice would be great. <laughs> <laughs> We're all basement dwellers. <laughs> So I got another question about the topic. What movie is this gift from? This is from this Short Circuit. Yeah. Short Circuit. Yeah. Short Circuit. Okay, I've never heard of it. You guys want to see Number the Number Five. That's a good movie. Number yeah. Dunny Five? Yeah. Input. Input. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the same thing there. 
Yes. That might be the number two. Yeah. All right, another question on topic. Um, that is ish. So, uh, where do you guys use? Well, I guess first of all, do you guys are you guys only doing uh, Windows um, malware, or do you guys do stuff for other operating systems like Linux? We have a mobile product for Android, and I can either confirm or deny whether we're working on other stuff, but we might be. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you could shed any light on like tools that are used in the GNU Linux world and the Unix world. Well, I mean, as far as Linux goes, you know, the primary targets of any sort of malicious activity uh, for Linux are aimed towards servers, right? Because that's primarily where the money is when it comes to Linux. You're not going to go after a Linux user because, you know, they're, they're usually smarter than your Windows user. Um, <laughs> when it comes to security and computing and things like that, right? Uh, Mac users, uh, not so much. And that's why... Uh, a lot of Mac malware is actually kind of script based. It's not even a real, it, like the Windows malware, it's some serious stuff. You know, it's, it's hidden behind the scenes crap. Um, everything else is, is more of a social engineering attack and then social engineering plus scripting. Uh, that's why, you know, you see stuff like, you know, there's, there's pups that are emerging in, in, uh, on Mac systems that we see more of. And, uh, you know, there's the occasional Mac malware, um, is it a completely secure operating system? No, obviously not. Uh, and and to think that is is foolish. I mean, I think we all should know that there is no completely secure operating. You know, the most secure computer ever is one that is unplugged and at the bottom of the ocean. You know, <laughs> that's that's the most secure you're ever going to get because you connect that thing regardless of the internet and, and you're doomed. You know. But uh, yeah. Mobile malware is pretty bad too. There's a lot of mobile ransomware going around, uh, but it's it's. You see a lot of stuff from like uh, people downloading from like an Android app store. Is that what you're talking about? There's or... third-party apps, yeah, but there, we've also seen instances of malvertising um, and like drive-by exploits that are specifically targeting um, malware or Android users. Uh, so even if it's not rampant right now. You know, because, you know, we, we obviously read a lot about it in the news, you know, new mobile malware. Ah. But uh, the reality of it is that it may not be super rampant in the States. It's crazy in Eastern Europe. Just nuts out over there. But it's also evolving. And, you know, we see new evolutions all the time. They're getting better and better at making this stuff. So it's just a matter of time before it becomes a really serious threat. And in the meantime, everyone else just kind of starts adopting these technologies as, yeah, I need this every day for everything, uh, me included. You know, so it's, it's the usual course of technology versus security where, you know, innovations are always take center stage over protections and things like that. I have a question back on the operating systems. Um, I know it's nothing ever completely secure and it never will be. Um, but do you think that the, um, as the, uh, the new OSs are all getting more and more complex, that uh, the security features of them are actually getting better in general? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely do. Um, you know, the so even it's much, much, much harder to get at. I mean, obviously, everything else will be getting more complex and advanced as well. But yeah, well, look at look at Windows Seven. I mean, Windows Seven, Windows uh, Eight, uh, and then soon to be Windows Ten. Uh, the user access control features. Fantastic, revolutionized everything. Um, the built-in, uh, you know, security suites, Windows Defender or whatever the hell it's being called these days. Uh, I, I use Windows 7 still, and so I use Microsoft Security Essentials because I'm cheap. <laughs> and I have Mauerbytes and Microsoft Security Essentials, and I'm happy, you know. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it's nice to have on there. It's a free product. It's built in now with Windows 8 and, and going onward, Windows 10. Um, the ability to, to kind of exploit things, uh, it's, it's, it's basically the, I think the creators of the systems have decided, all right, look, back in the day, we thought we wanted this to be super easy. User friendliness was paramount, right? You want to make things super easy for people because they never used computers before. We don't live in that world anymore. We live in a world where everybody uses computers. So you can go up a level when it comes to how technical, technically savvy they, they need to be to use the system. And with that in mind, you can make things a little more difficult in the sense of authentications required. You still get a lot of people that are like, I don't ever want to click that. I hate clicking that stuff. But you know what? 
there, there's there's victims and then there's people that are yet to be victims. You know, it's it's <laughs> that's how that's how it works. You know, you either have been through it or you're either concerned about it or you will be concerned because you're going to get infected or something's going to happen. You know, I mean, there are those people out there, the loud mouths that I'm sure you guys will hear lots of being in this industry now that say, ah, you don't need antivirus or any malware. You know, you just all you have to do is say surfing and you, you think to yourself, well, you, you know what, to you that makes sense. And to us that makes sense too. But there are still, you know, people like at Apple getting hacked. There's the governments with, with multi-billion dollar budgets and security getting attacked, you know, getting infiltrated. Huge corporations like Sony and Target getting infiltrated. Yeah. You know, this isn't just a, a deal where, you know, you can't get attacked because, you know, you just keep an eye on things or you just avoid going to a sketchy porn site. You know, that's that's not how it works anymore. And, uh, of course, you know, your, your children and elderly people are still the biggest targets because they're the easiest ones for the bad guys to go after. But um, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that, you know, everyone's safe. In fact, I've often referred to our time in history now uh, as far as the development of how secure or safe the internet is as a world war. We're in a complete world war right now when it comes to, to the cyber threat landscape and not, not by company, not by countries, but by individuals, you know, as we are all kind of our own individual countries and, you know, nation states and things like that with our systems and our property and, and our things we need to keep safe. So we get invaded all the time. Uh, it used to be the old West, the Wild West, you know, now it's, now it's a war. One further question on that, just, I know you have no answer for it, but, um, I can see a lot about no answers. <laughs> from, from the landscape that you're seeing, do you feel like there's more, like the percentage of people who are going after more of the, um, making malware versus making non-malware is getting, you know, there's a higher ratio of it or there's a less rate, there's a smaller ratio. Obviously there's more, there's more yeah. developers. Um, yeah, there are there are more uh, the the development of variants. Uh, that's also something that's pretty pretty rampant. Um, you do have a lot more people involved in the whole the whole industry, and as far as the the cyber crime goes, and it, it keep in mind it is an industry. It's an organizational thing. It's 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 the mob. It's the mafia. You know, <laughs> this isn't dealing with some you know angry teenagers in their in their you know parents' uh, houses. These are cyber criminals. These are organized crime syndicates that employ, you know, cyber criminals. Um, so, so is there more of it? Absolutely. Uh, one thing that it's probably of interest to you is that where does the line between uh, not malicious and malicious, you know, where is that drawn? And the reality is that we've been seeing over the last couple of years that that line is becoming a little more fuzzy when you see things like potentially wanted programs that are now be targeting, being targeted by companies like mine, but there's a reason for that. Not just because they're an annoyance, you know, because we've seen malware being pushed with uh, search toolbars, with weather uh, apps, with stuff like that. You know, it's um, that I've seen a Bitcoin miner being installed because of a, of a potentially a wanted program, a freaking Bitcoin miner. I mean, malware is one thing, but a Bitcoin miner will destroy your system. You know, <laughs> if it's if your system is not built for that kind of stuff, it will destroy it. Uh, it will wear down your hardware. You know, and that's that's a huge it's a huge danger to you that you're losing money at that point. You know, it's not a matter of maybe I will, maybe I won't. As far as credit cards go, it's definitely you will be losing money. <clears throat> so, if that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, thank you. No problem. No problem. Does anybody There's else have more questions? Happy to answer whatever you guys want. I mean, you're the. So, so how, you guys, I'm, I'm actually kind of confused as far as how does the whole class structure work, and and uh, like, is this part of a overall degree program, or is it just an individual class? This is actually uh, ACM SIG, Special Interest Group. Okay, so you guys aren't even a class. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And it's also at the same time, it's a professional group of, you know, incident response oh. and self-friends assist. So 
we kind of straddle the line between student group and professional organization. There, I know that nowadays there's a lot more uh, of a cybersecurity, you know, curriculum in, in a lot of colleges and stuff like that. They didn't have that really when I was going through. Um, I like I'm an old man or anything, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. We, we plan some of that great. too, and some of us are involved in all of that too. Uh, I was just curious how those how those played out. I mean, yeah. Well, cool. Um, it's a great industry, you know, and uh, it's it needs more people. It needs more talent. Uh, you know, we still get people that come in there, and you hear about them all the time, that say, I'm getting into this industry because I want to make money, because I know it's going to make me money. And you hear that, and it breaks your heart, because I know guys who, you know, who will work 12, 14 hours a day because they are passionate about this. You know, I've got guys that, that go out there and they hunt down everything from not just, you know, websites that are, and, and, and you know, groups and things like that that are pushing malware, but fake pharmaceutical sites, uh, tech support scammers. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have followed how much work we've done with, with trying to shut down tech support scammers, but we've had you know, some of our guys testify against some of these organizations um, because they're, they're screwing people over, you know. Uh <clears throat> So this isn't this isn't an industry where yeah you're probably gonna make some money but at the end of the day you gotta love to work you know um, and you gotta be a little insane uh, I think <laughs> one thing I always say to people is that to do reverse engineering to do malware analysis at all really but especially reverse engineering of malware you have to be a little crazy and to like it you have to be full crazy <laughs> so you enjoy it you know because it is like I said a lot of pounding your head on things. Um, but the payoff is worth it. And, uh, you know, I used to work for, for, uh, for government agencies uh, in the past and, you know, my, my work of report writing or whatever else I did, it just vanished into the ether, you know, into the, the, the never ending, uh, file cabinet. And you just never saw it again, never saw what happened to it. But on the outside working for Malwarebytes, you know, I get pulled over, both you know, like when I'm at conferences, but also just walking down the street if I'm wearing like my my Arby's hoodie or something like that. And you know, I get emails and messages. I see the forums and comments on our blog about how we've helped people. You know, and so that our efforts have made a difference in people's lives. And that's that's worth it, man. That's 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 why you do it. You know, because otherwise, I don't think there is an amount of money that can that can really you know make up for for what I would say is kind of uh, realization about how bad people can be, you know, and not the people you're trying to protect, but the cyber criminals, you know, they, like I said, this is, this is beyond just computer versus computer. We're dealing with psychological attacks against users to, in, to infect, to extort the harm, you know, and it's, it's ridiculous and it's you know, disgusting and sad that this no place, this should never have been involved, you know, in our wonderful utopia of the internet of, you know, things like that. Yes, we're superheroes. <laughs> and we can't save the world though. I mean, we can't, we can't just make everybody understand or see the way things are. And that's, that's the other hard part that you guys um, may or may not experience is that, uh, you know, you get people that will come to you when they need your help and you help them. And when you try to tell everyone else, Hey, you know, be secure, be safe, learn these things I'm trying to tell you. I mean, I, my team runs our blog. And so I know firsthand, we write articles, we talk to people, we're trying to push out this education and inform folks about the real dangers out there. And we get a lot of people that push back for whatever crazy reason, or they just don't care. They don't read it. They don't, they don't, it doesn't make, it doesn't matter to them. And that's also a disheartening part of it where you're going to hit a lot of brick walls. Um, but like I said, at the end of the day, it's you versus the bad guys. And, uh, and it's, it's worth it to see the people that do, you know, appreciate your help. I could rant forever, guys. So <laughs> we'll probably wrap up here. Yeah, really wrap up. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I want to thank you for uh, coming out, Adam. This has been a really good talk. Not a problem. I've I've loved it. Uh, I hope your time and your knowledge. I hope some sure of it is useful. Some of you guys. I know a lot of it was technical, and some of it might have been uh, below 
your expectations. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what you're expecting to learn. Honestly, if you've ever tried to give a, a talk on malware analysis, you realize pretty quickly that unless someone's got a computer in front of them and the tools that you're trying to show them, uh, it's kind of hard. <laughs> but the methodology, that's honestly the most important part. Though. Is you can learn all the tools, you can learn all the tricks and the technical part, but the mindset of an analyst of, of someone trying to tear apart malware, that's something that you can't, uh, you can't teach from a book in my opinion. So experience, you know? Okay. Well, that concludes the meeting. I want to say a few things here. Uh, so again, this is the last meeting of the semester and we will resume again in, uh, for small fall semester, I believe it is. Yep. And, um, we have all those projects going on over the summer. Uh, so if anybody's interested in working on the, working with the courses or the lab or helping us um, redesign our website uh, or even uh, submitting graphic ideas or graphical designs for our t-shirts and such, uh, let us know. We'll continue uh, trying to organize and get all that stuff ready to go and squared for next semester. And um, I guess that's, some, that's it. Uh, take care, everyone. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. All right. Take care. Oh, I guess uh, everybody who uh, could uh, that like to talk to, uh, thank him for coming with a tweet or something.